paints. It seems like these days every model manufacturer has their own paints but their set of paint is never just any set of paint it's always these aren't any paints these are luxurious hyper pigmented sexy waxy paints but really hey guys it's my eating time and today we're going to be looking at paints i've used pretty much one manufacturer for a good number of years and well, despite how you guys probably know me now, it wasn't actually Rebel, it was Humbrol. The reasoning for this was pretty, I guess, rational, really. For me, the easiness of which I could get paints was, you know, the, the most important thing. And Hobbycraft, which is a UK national chain, used to stock Humbrol paints. So for me, just going off to a local hobby craft and my paints was a lot easier, particularly when I worked really old shifts that meant I always fell outside retail hours, even over weekends. So why did I swap to Revell? Well, I swapped to Revell purely because for whatever reason, hobby crafts stop stocking comparable paints and I guess all FX goods. FX, are you okay babe? But as a result of Hobbycraft not stocking FX and comparable goods, it meant that the paint that they had available was either Rebel or Tamiya. Tamiya I was always a bit afraid of, for uh, no reason really. So I decided to take the plunge with Rebel. If we roll forward a few years, I also learned about other paint brands too as well, such as, you know, Hella having its own paint range and Italeri having its own paint range and even Svesta. I really wanted to test them alongside other paint brands just to see if I I was really missing out and also because I hear so much good news about other paint brands that I don't really use at the moment. This project originally started with me just testing manufacturer's paints so FX, oh, Umbro, Hella, Tamiya, Ravel and Italeri. Oh and Zvezda. This project grew much bigger though. It turned into a massive project where I decided to test some other paint brands as well. Vallejo, Extra Acrylic, which is the acrylic version of Extra Color, and also Pataka, which I actually had used before, but I wanted to include it in this, you know, paint free for all. As I've just sort of mentioned, I haven't really done any enamel, and the reason for that is I don't use enamels, and I think I would be the wrong person to be testing that. I am a brush acrylic painter, so I will be testing as a brush acrylic painter. I'm not going to try and be something that I'm not. As for airbrushing, I'd love to be able to test all these with an airbrush, but at present I don't have an airbrush. It's something that's off the table. Obviously you can always donate to my Kobe if you want to see that in the future, because, you know, every penny helps. <laughs> so how am I doing this? Well, I decided I was going to take a massive plunge with this project and just do one whole aircraft per manufacturer. Now, the aircraft themselves, you're not going to see the full assembly of them, they will have videos of their own talking about the history of those kits, the aircraft behind them, and, you know, the full assembly and full reveal, but what you're going to see today, in this video, is me painting those aircraft and how they look at the end. So you will get some spoilers for those videos, I guess, but it's really important for me that I don't just do, like, a square on a piece of paper, or I don't just test it on, like, you know, a figurine or something. For me, this is about testing it as a modeler. There are lots of videos out there for those who do figurine painting or figure painting or tabletop painting, however you want to describe it. For example, Squidmar did a massive project similar to this, but even bigger for those who are into tabletop. So if that's what you're after. I recommend you go and check out Squidmar's video. This is mainly going to be aviation, but will apply to, you know, tanks, boats, or really any model itself that's not just wargaming, because wargaming is a very different type of painting, I think. I'm going to go through now and tell you exactly why I'm painting with each brand, and also so that you know, with Airfix or Humbrol, I'm going to be referring to Airfix and Humbrol interchangeably. They're part of the same parent company. It is what it is, so just just be aware of that. <laughs> so for Airfix or Humbrol, we're actually painting a Spitfire Mark 1, and that is a Airfix kit, so that fits really nicely. For Hella, we're also doing a Hella kit, and that is a Delta Twine D520. Ravel, we're doing a Ravel kit, and that's a BF109. For Tamiya, we are not using a Tamiya kit, but it is by Hasegawa, and that's an A6M0. For Italeri, we're not doing an Italeri kit, and that's purely because I really wanted to do the Fiat G50, and I already had purchased the Vintage Classics one, so that's what we're doing for Italeri, we're doing a Fiat G50. For Zvezda, we are doing a Zvezda brand kit, and it's a Yank 3. I'll talk more later about Zvezda, don't worry, I know that's probably raising some concerns right now. For Hitaka, we're doing an Arma PZL P11C. We've done the P11A before, so, you know, pretty similar. For Vallejo, we're doing an RS Models Heinkel HE112 of the Spanish Air Force. For Extra Colour, we are doing something slightly different, we're doing... <laughs> 
<laughs> a frog fucker XXI or 21. Uh, it's a World War II Dutch aircraft. I know I've broken my trend a little bit, but that was just because, again, it was another aircraft I wanted to do and it didn't feel like buying RAF colours for like the millionth time. Now, I did also try and buy black and white for every company and I did do like tests of like black and white and how many coats it took to get like a consistent black or a consistent white. But I'll be really honest with you, I don't think it turned that useful. Um, most people who do modelling will use black as a colour if you're I say as a colour, you know, I mean like you paint it on after you've already chromed the aircraft but to be honest, the results I got pretty much line up with the model results so it will be at the end of this video but I just don't think it's that useful so I'm not going to focus on it. Sorry! <laughs> oh and also I couldn't get white for some of the brands or one of the brands. Finally, scoring. I scored in a few different categories and this is entirely subjective. So I don't want you to think this is some definitive review that you should buy whoever I recommend because everyone is gonna have different feelings and opinions. There's a reason, besides cost, that different paint brands exist because some people just prefer the formula, the feeling, you know, lots of different things over a different paint brand. I've tried to be as distant from my personal experiences as I can to get results that I think are fair but also actually quite useful for other people. So the categories I scored on were consistency, accessibility, pigmentation, self-leveling, pooling, price, enjoyment, effectiveness and the paint pot design. This was all added together except pooling, that was a negative point scale, um, I'd say I think minus five, that gave you a total score and it was very interesting as I say not to ruin it but I think there was only one brand out of all the ones that we go through today that I don't think I enjoyed or would use again potentially. As I mentioned earlier as well this is all going to be brush painted. There is obviously a cost element with the airbrush but that also means that the majority of people who actually do model making casually, those people who potentially don't go to shows or they don't display at shows but attend them, the people who are average model makers use generally paint brushes and I think it's really important to reflect that experience particularly for people who are coming into the hobby who don't have disposable income and also we are going to be going through a cost of living crisis and for some people an airbrush like myself it's just entirely out of reach and so I wanted this video to help as many people as possible. Airbrush experiences are always going to be different to brush experience so please don't take this for that. Also I am fully aware that some brands may potentially work better in airbrushes than as brush painting and I have factored that into how I've sort of done everything during the course of this video. Right so should we get into it? Oh my god I'm so excited this is so scary doing this video. Airfix Humbrol. Starting with a home brand then we have Airfix or Humbro. Airfix have a bit of a weird reputation. I mean even with their models, their models historically were not necessarily the highest quality but they were such a massive brand that everyone knew about them, everyone had memories of them but I feel in terms of their model kits they have upped their game recently. They are now one of the best model kit manufacturers around. I absolutely adore their most recent kits, I think they are fantastically engineered and work really really nicely. As for their paints, mm, uh, it's less straightforward. I used to use their paints a lot as I mentioned previously in this video and I've actually used them both in brush form and in airbrush form and I don't think I ever really had the same disregard that other model makers did. I, I've seen a lot of like if you're a true model maker you might use other paint brands but you know, we're just going to see how this turns out. I am using a wet palette for the majority of these. I'm trying to make sure that each paint is given, you know, the best possible conditions to get the best possible outcome. I don't think I really got footage of it and I don't really feel that it's that important. For me, the most important thing was seeing how it reacted in the actual kit itself, so that's what we're going to be looking at. So, Airfix, Humbrol. <sighs> there are some issues I have. First of all, I ordered um, the set of paints that you can see here. This is the Humbrol Aria paint set. It was really good value for money. I've seen it as low as like £12 in some places, mainly second hand but not used. I think I bought mine not very much more than that, actually brand new. One thing Epix does have on its side is their acrylics are fantastic value for money. However, I found that some of the bottles in my set had clogged. Before I'd even put them onto the wet palette or put them onto a brush, I unscrew the caps, I try and pull them out and 
it's sort of leaked up through the spout of the bottle and has already leaked and clogged and congealed and means I can't get any paint out. I ended up having to use a combination of things to get the paint out because it went really quite deep and for some of them that sort of ruined the bottles. You are, I guess, in an essence getting what you pay for. I also found that the bottles were just like casually undressing themselves. You'd get them out and they'd be like, hey, let me just go nude in front of you. And, and look, ethics, I'm all for body positivity, but I do like my bottles to have their clothes on so I can see exactly what shape they are, so, you know. Actually being applied to the models though, these paints look actually really good. Pigmentation was a lot better than I remembered and thinned down with a little bit of water, they did seem to level out pretty well by themselves. Pulling was present, but it wasn't, you know, dire. It wasn't gonna stop me using them or ruin the model itself. It was kind of, as I expected, just as the edges of the lining of the camouflage, so it was nothing really too serious. Filling in and layering did take a little bit of time, but this is entirely normal with acrylics. Sometimes you want to just go in thinner layers and get a really nice build up of colour over time. The pilot was painted easily and I actually really loved how it looked at first, however, due to various scheduling things I had to move the models around a lot and I handled him a lot and eventually he got quite grubby and didn't look anywhere near as good so don't judge the final photos of the pilot too much because he looked fantastic before. So, FX. Overall I was really impressed with how it looked in the model. Actually I think it looked really good but I am kind of bitterly disappointed by the quality control. Now just to clarify, this doesn't mean that this won't change over time. As of filming and with the sets that I use, this was the case and it's something that I have experienced previously. But I'm aware that there's like a generation two coming out. But from what I've seen, there were also issues with like the bowls, you know, trying to strip. So I'm not sure how much of that has changed. As far as I'm aware, it's the paint inside that's changed more and then the other issues may still remain. So impressed with the paints, not so much with the QC. Hello. Uh, I guess we're getting this one out the way early, huh? Just to give a complete side note, I should be really biased towards this. Airfix and Hella are ones that are really close to my heart. Hella in particular is something that really reinvigorated my spirit of modelling as a teenager when I was in France in like a caravan holiday with my parents and we were like walking down to the beach and there was like a toy shop up in the village and I asked my dad if I could Get it. And eventually he bought me the Patrouille de France um, anniversary set that Hella had done and ever since then I've always had a soft spot for Hella, you know? Hell, I even built the entire history of Patrouille de France in one some second scale. So, you know, it, it means a lot to me. So to say I was looking forward to these paints is nothing short of an understatement. I was absolutely over the moon to get these paints in the post. Hella had a lot of expectations to meet and could they meet them? Opening paints? <sighs> yeah, that's where the shock started. So yeah, I ordered these from France. At the same time, I also ordered the Italo paints and I also ordered, I think, Hatago from abroad and Zvezda as well. So I'm not allowing that as an excuse. Frankly, most paints at some point in their journey to the consumer will have international travel and, and potentially further travel in the post, whether that's internal or international. Bear in mind, internal post can also be just as drastic as international in some circumstances. So yeah, it's not an excuse. Most of the paints were congealed or in some stage of congealing. Congealedness? No, it's congealing, I'm sure. Either way, they were lumpy, bumpy, and kind of grumpy. Don't get me wrong, this ain't my best radio. I tried to revive them. Some with water, some with acrylic thinner, some with just whatever mediums I had lying around, but I tell you, honey, couldn't revive them. I think they had just got to that point where they were so dry that it was like trying to rub paint off, off a model or off a canvas or anything else. Sometimes it just doesn't work. It was really, really clear that the air had managed to seep into these bottles and just destroy the paint. Some of them had survived absolutely fine. Some of them just, I had to just let them rest in peace. I did manage to get the painting done on the model itself, but it's an absolute monstrosity. The very limited detail that was already on this really old kit, the D520, had pretty much been engulfed by this wave of thick, grumpy, lumpy paint. And it was just 
ruined, if I'm really honest with you. I will have to buy a new D520 to do a video both on this kit, which I really wanted to do in part because of the artwork of the kit, but also just because it's an icon of French aviation. So yeah, to say I'm a little bit pissed is pretty accurate. Yeah, unsurprisingly, Heller has scored pretty poor, and I'm 99.999% recurring that this is due to their bottle design. Their bottles are small, sort of vintage ink well style bottles. You know, they have like this thick base with this small opening for the well, and they are really cute, but they don't seem to close very well. <sighs> it's a disappointment. Really, I think this is just because there's no seal inside the bottle. The bottle is literally just bottle, cap, that's it. There's no seal to break. So it easily succumbs to its nemesis, the air. I, I didn't really ever get to see these paints live up to their full potential, but who knows, Hella, maybe you want to send me a new batch of paints so I can try them again? Yeah, me. Ravel. Two things to bring up whilst I'm going to be doing Ravel. Firstly, obviously this is a paint that I'm really familiar with using. It's one that is my mainstay, my main supplier paint that I use. So I, I'm gonna try and distance myself, but I may receive better results from this paint purely by the fact that I have used this more. So yeah, just, you know, be aware of that. And I just want all my biases to be really clear. Secondly, I didn't have two of the colours. I've tried to buy all the colours as accurately to instructions as I could or any conversion charts or whatever, but for this instance, I didn't have them. I didn't want to buy new paints, so I just mixed them myself because I'm really confident with Ravel paints to do that. So just be fully aware of that. If the colour doesn't fully match, that's not the paint's fault, that's my fault. So let's talk about them. Ravel paints, I think, are really consistent. I don't think I've really had any issues with them, and again, I've used them for quite a long time, so you know, it's not surprising they score well there. Their paint bots are probably the most unique design on this list, not being a circle at all, whereas everything else is some cylinder of some kind. I guess he's kind of odd. So it's like a cube that you split into, undo it, and then it's got a cylindrical well inside that, but it's got this really solid square base. It does help with stability. It can make them a bit harder to knock over. I know, I've nearly done it. The lid itself has a really shallow reservoir in that you can use then to mix paints in, which I've done quite a lot, you know, it's really nice to do that, or you can thin them down to the consistency that you want. It's just a nice added extra, particularly for those who are more casual with model making, those who might not have the space to have like a proper dedicated workspace. It's nice to just have that little section where you can go, okay, I just want to add a little bit of yellow in this particular shade or whatever. I do genuinely find that pigmentation is pretty good. Gloss paints, not so much, but my understanding is that's pretty common for gloss paints in general. Gloss paints tend to be harder to get high pigmentation with. You will find that with spray cans in particular or airbrushing, you will get better coverage. This is something that is very, very, very specific to brush painting in particular. However, to say that, I've got really good results with gloss paints anyway. Uh, white is perhaps one of the hardest colours for any brand to do, and I do find that all their paints are fine with just water for thinning, but the actual acrylic thinner is even better for glossy paints and also for white as well, so it may be worth having it for that. With this project though, I've tried to treat most paints the same. Unless you can't use water, I've used water as thinner. If you can't use water, I probably still use water. Even though I have the thinner, the reason I've done it is because I am an incredibly lazy human being. Whenever I'm streaming or whether I'm just painting for myself, I tend to just go, hey, I've got a pot to clean my brushes in. That is water. That will do. As I say, average model maker, what did you guys expect? One thing to mention here is accessibility. These are some of the more accessible paints in the UK. For, again, an average model maker, I really want to get across that that's what this is really looking at. A lot of people's first experience with models may be somewhere like Hobbycraft, where they're just curious or want to have a look. Now, Ravel paints are stocked there. That's the reason I swapped over to them, because of my shifts. Ken, Humbrol, or any other brand at a local shop was just not feasible, so I decided to just, you know, go for whatever I could actually get. Because sometimes you just forget a paint and you really want to do it, and it's either like a weekend or it's later in the evening, and probably grab to that for you. For that reason, they're really accessible. 
And also a lot of independent stores do seem to stock Revell as well. It's not something I've ever particularly struggled with. Weirdly, my local one doesn't stop them, but we won't talk about that. And I'll say, that's the reason I'm now with Ravel. I mean, hey, if any other paint brands want to send me a load of their paints over to try and swing me over, um, you know, I go both ways, honey. Just drop me an email. <laughs> Another thing we'll talk about in a lot more detail later on is also conversion charts. There are a lot of conversion charts for Ravel because their paints are so mainstream and so largely accepted, I guess. There's a lot out there for you to find those paints. Quite often, if you're not sure, if you just Google conversion chart and look through that, or if you're really not sure, Google Revell and the FS number that you're trying to find, if you know what that is, then quite often you'll find it in some forum somewhere. I know that's how I ended up using the Lufthansa blue for the uh, Frecce Tricolori set that I did. So, you know, it, it does work. <laughs> that was it. We'll talk about conversion charts a bit later on. Italeri. A tallery are an interesting one. I'm 99% sure that I've used at least one of their paints before. Where? I couldn't possibly tell you. But I'm pretty sure that I have, and I've definitely used their paintbrushes before. Which means I think I bought a paint set at some point with a tallery branding. When I was looking at a tallery, I originally started looking at individual paints, but then I found a uh, Regia Aeronautica set, and I was already hooked. Italian World War II aircraft are some of my favourite around. I've got a Savio Marchetti SM79 that sat in my display cupboard, sadly missing a front prop, but proudly displayed there. But it's one of my earliest fully finished models that I actually stripped from a crappy paint job that I had on it before and did something lovely on it as a dedication to my dad. Now, this set was going to be used on a Fiat G50. I love that the G50 is one of my favourite early World War II aircraft. It's just got a really unique boxy design. The fact that it's still an open cockpit because the pilots did not want to be enclosed, it's bizarre and I adore it. I will do a video on it at some point. Now, talking about the paints itself, obviously coming in a set makes them really accessible. I can't speak for how often these are going to be available, but I have seen these on Amazon. There are various sets, there seem to be quite a lot of sets, to be perfectly honest, for a lot of different air forces, so it really adds the accessibility value. In terms of wearing their individual paints, I think I've only ever seen these once at a model shop. That was quite some time ago. I don't think they're particularly common, so I wouldn't say that these are ones you can fully rely on. But they are accessible, and if not, you can always order them like I did from France. Yeah, I know. You probably thought I ordered them from Italy, huh? Nope. <laughs> Same place I bought the Hella ones. One thing to mention with the Italo paints is I found they were insanely consistent. Every single paint that I used had the same sort of viscosity, thickness, texture that, you know, the previous paint did. No matter what one I was using, I didn't really find a struggle at all, which can certainly be the case for some paint brands. Painting Italian camouflage is sort of a mole pattern. I did mine wrong because I did it from memory, so don't judge the actual paint itself, like the paint scheme. It's a lot larger print, I guess I should say, than it should have been. It should be lots more tiny little dots than bigger blobs, but Overall, I was really happy with the consistency of the paints. The pigmentation seemed pretty good and the colour accuracy also seemed really nice. Again, because they come in these sets, the price is also kind of pretty good. Not necessarily the best, I don't think they make really best ethics, but they are pretty damn good. However, I do have to say that I did find that they pulled a bit more. Not entirely sure why. This could be an experience thing, and again, this is something I'm trying to bake into all of this, is that this is my first impressions of a lot of these paints. I don't think it would be enough to pit me off. I think it would just make me a bit more cautious. However, I did get a result that I'm really happy with. If you look at the actual plane itself, it does look pretty nice. There's nothing glaringly obvious about the paints that I've used. The leveling seems pretty all right for what it's worth. It seems to have flattened down to a nice even surface. I didn't have any struggles with details over the top, which sometimes you can find little bumps in the paint. Didn't really find that. So yeah, I was kind of happy with the Atari ones. These are ones though that you may not find on conversion charts. I would say that, that yes, they're really accessible in terms of being able to get them, and even ordering them from France, they're still quite cheap, really, for what they are. But they also have the downside that you might not know what individual colours to get because, you know, conversion charts aren't super easy. 
it is offset by the sets somewhat because of being out of order just a set for really good value, <laughs> you know, means you're not going to worry too much about it, but yeah, it's something that I've taken into consideration. Hataka. Hataka paints are something I've used before. I'm pretty sure I used them for a similar reason than that I'm using them today. I was trying to paint something and I, I can't remember what it was. It was back when I used an airbrush a bit as well. And it was just something very specific and I couldn't work out exactly what paints I needed. So I bought the Hataka set because, you know, it came with everything I needed to paint that Air Force for that year, right? Well, you know, mostly. And, you know, we're painting PZL P11C today and this came with everything that I needed to do it. So, you know, great. The impression I get for these paints are these are more for, you know, less casual modelers. These are for people who are really into their model making, definitely going to be using some form of airbrush. For me though, we are just looking at this from a brush painter's perspective, so let's just not talk about all the airbrush usage for now. This is just for the hairy stick users. I don't really have a lot to say about Hitaka, and it's not because they're bad, and it's not because I think they're not good, if that made sense. I just didn't really enjoy using them, and enjoyment is a factor, and it's gonna sound really weird, but they felt really grainy. I did try, like, thinning them in different ways, but it just felt grainy. Did I get a model that ended up looking really nice? Yes, of course I did. Pigmentation, fantastic. Leveling, fantastic. But it just didn't feel nice to use. So, sorry if you're a massive Hadaka fan, and you know, these are your go-to paints, but for, they're just not for me, and that's fine. We don't all have to like the same thing. We don't have to gatekeep brands or tell other people their brands are rubbish or be fanboys or fangirls, you know. Not everyone has to love every brand. If I can ever afford an airbrush, I would absolutely love to try this out properly with an airbrush. I do have a couple of these little aircraft that need to use the same colours, so hey, maybe I will try it at some point and you can see whether or not that is the case. Much like with the Tallery and the Humbrol, I did look at, you know, the sets for this and because it comes in a set which has really good colour accuracy, it does mean that this can be sort of a one-stop shop for anyone who's into models. I mean, hey, if I was just building the PZL on my own and I just had enough money to do so, I would just buy this set. The set wasn't particularly cheap. I did manage to get this set, but it seems to have had its price hiked a little bit. I don't know if it was just out of stock or whatever elsewhere, but yeah, it's it wasn't the cheapest. But again, like, you're getting all of the paints, you know they're going to be good colours. It is really convenient. You know, and for new people that can be the scariest thing is making sure you get the right thing. Extra acrylic. Can I just start this off by saying Hanats, honey, I love you. You're you're a fantastic shop. But for the love of God, please, please put paint previews properly on your website. And also navigating the paints, just do a drop down list, please. Like just put it as extra acrylic, bottle size, and then you drop down list because Navigating your site just to browse colours, I think is a nightmare. It's something that could be so easily done. I love your site otherwise, don't get me wrong, but I did not like it for paints. <laughs> I actually ended up using a different site, which I ended up ordering from, to find the colours I actually needed. I ended up ordering from that site purely because you don't have black in stock, which you know is just one of those things, I'm not really fussed about that. But yeah, I shouldn't need to go to a second website to see a colour preview. This could even be something that was just a tantal issue at the time, I don't really know. But it seems such a shame because their bottles are really good at showing you what colours they are, and it just seems like a letdown that, you know, was, I should be able to see what colour I'm buying. <laughs> I wouldn't go get my nails done if I couldn't see what colour nail I was going to have, would I? Anyway, that accessibility point aside, you know, this is the paint where I did do a Fokker XXI or E21. The reason for this, as I said earlier, was just because I didn't want to buy RF colours that would just sit in a drawer and not be used because I had those already and I really wanted to do a D21 because I love this little beautiful aircraft so yeah, we're doing the Doubtful Dutch Fighter for this one rather than a British aircraft I'm breaking the trend that I've done with all the other manufacturers. I have never used this brand before though, just to be really clear. I've heard of extra colour a lot, I've heard of extra acrylic a lot, but I've just never used them. 
Part of that was just because I had to order a wine, if I'm really, really honest. I don't like ordering things if I don't know if they're going to work. And you know, you can probably find a hundred videos out there that show you that it works really well and uh, millions of models that have been painted with extra colour and extra filler. But for me, that was just the reason. It's my own logic. No, you know, that, that is what it is. <laughs> but I kind of regret that a little bit because they're not super expensive paints and they do work really, really nicely. I did find the initial layer didn't want to bond particularly well with the undercoated plastic, but I mean, that's not particularly unusual. I mean, do you find that sometimes with acrylic? So it could also be a case that I wasn't thinning it quite to the right ratio. Again, new paints to me, these things do happen, so I didn't really hold it against it because by the time I was on the second layer and third layer, it didn't really matter. The pigmentation was actually really nice. Um, not the best, I don't think, that we've had in this entire paint that list that we're going through, but they're definitely up there. At the end of painting it though, I ended up with an aircraft that has a really lovely feel and colour to it. My middle shelf is pretty much my high bed, and every morning I've got up, I've pretty much looked at my D21 because it's just so vibrant and lovely so yeah it's definitely a really good paint brand and they're not too shabby price for pop either so where are they gonna place well you'll find out soon tamia this is the paint i knew i'd fall down on <laughs> and not by how i use it not by my end result but because i'm not already using it already tamia is a paint that's so well loved that if you don't use it people are like uh, why I mean, like Tamiya and Vallejo are both pretty much that at the moment. They are also kind of accessible. Um, again, they have them at Hobbycraft, that we've mentioned millions of times. And the only reason I'm mentioning that store is because, like, in the UK, it's pretty much the hobby store and one of the only, like, mainstream stores that's open, I think, till like 8 o'clock at night that sorts of model kits, model paints, model glue, model supplies, all that stuff. So it, it's actually quite a good lifeline for a lot of people. They don't appear consistently on the website though. Not really sure why, not really sure what the agreement is. One of my friends wasn't even sure that Tammy would be in that store and I was like, look, hey, I've been to like six different hobby crafts and they've been in every one. I'm sure they'll be there and lo and behold they were, even though it wasn't advertised on the website at all. But they don't seem to be going away either. It seems that Hobbycraft currently still have like Tamiya, Italeri, and Ravel products and paints for Ravel and Tamiya. It's bizarre. You'll also find that a lot of train shops and also model shops have Tamiya as well. I know that Tamiya have managed to bridge that gap quite well between sort of plastic model maker and train painting as well. Um, they just seem universally loved. I know people in wargaming as well and general tabletop gaming that just love these two. So Tamiya is a brand that has managed to bridge all the gaps that most manufacturers don't seem to be able to do. And hey, failing that, online shops like eModels or Wonderland Models will have these in stock, so, you know. As for performance, Tamiya are perhaps the single most consistent paint on this list today. And in fact, actually when I was going through sort of reviewing the list that I've done and writing the script for this video, I upped their points because I didn't think that actually what I'd given them was fair. They were, by and away, the most consistent brand on this list. That thought process also applied for other elements as well, such as their pigmentation. That was also pretty much bang on point each time. And their leveling was one of the best. I'll be honest, their paint is just a really easy medium to work with. Super beginner friendly in my opinion. It does come at a cost though. I would say these paints are on the more expensive end of paints, but you potentially will use less than you think you will. It's a bit of a dicey question to ask though because I've got paints that I bought years ago with the Ravel that I've still got, that I've still got most of because I've used it on one model, two models and then not really ever touched it again. I would say with Tamiya, if you're new to modelling, if you can afford it, they are a great starting point. However, if you can't afford them like every time that you can afford to buy a paint each time, you could buy like, I don't know, start with like black and white and buy them alongside other brands, cheaper brands, or if you've got a starter kit that comes with paints, you could use that. It, it's something you may want to build up slowly over time. But I'd like to think from what I've said already, you can tell this is a premium brand paint and you are getting what you pay for. You know, the extra value does seem to be worth it in this instance. That's not always the case though, but it does seem to be here. 
pink one as well. It's not like the older Humbrol design or the current sort of Citadel inks design, where it sort of pops open and has a little wine on it. It's just a wide glass pot. Harder to knock over, very strong. I guess more economically friendly as well if it's glass too, so that's always a bonus. You do tend to be able to buy the glass paint pots as well that you can mix your own paints in as well, which I have used and it has been a godsend for me when I had a gold that I needed to save at the time. It still unnerves me, I'm not gonna lie, having a paint pot that's sort of round and open, but I never knocked any over. And they're also quite low, they're not high up like the dropper bottles are or you know, the tolerate paints are, so. You know, pick your pals, I guess. Otherwise, I'd say, yeah, Tamiya scores really well, other than those really small caveats. Zvesta. Okay, our penultimate paint and one that everyone asks, are you still going to include this in the video? Or, you know, the very few people I told I was doing this project to? And the answer is yes. I ordered all of these from a Russian model shop way before the war was going to start. And as unfortunate as that is, I, it did mean that I got my paints. <laughs> like, before everything happened, I felt very weird. I didn't open the box when everything first happened. But ultimately I decided this is about model making. This is about a brand who are massive, who are still gonna exist, who are still gonna be within, I guess, the Russian sphere of influence. And you'll still get these in starter kits, I guess. Also, I've always wanted to try these paints, and I'd already bought them. It wasn't as if I was them giving money later on. So, it is a very conflicting point for me. I'm sorry if it upsets anyone that I've included this, but please know I did think very long and hard about whether or not I should include this. You guys already know where I stand anyway. Freedom from persecution, being able to be your true self, and independence are very important to me, so, you know. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll talk about the paints themselves. And I was really unsure. I'd seen maybe one video on this paint before, and it was painting like a Warhammer-y, tabletop-y figure. And it wasn't necessarily helpful for me thinking about painting a model aircraft, something that I wanted to look paint-wise historically related. I'm not going to say historically accurate because I'm not talented enough, but historically related. And, you know, I also ended up without a white paint, um, couldn't order one obviously later on, um, did get a yellow though, don't know if that was just my mistake in ordering, but it is what it is, like not, it's not the end of the world. First thing we're going to talk about, the pots. Why? 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 Why are they like this, Svesda? So the pots are basically tiny little cylinders of death and fate. They are awful. You have to take the lid off to get to the actual paint itself, which is fine. But then you just have this tiny little cylinder that's sat open, getting ready to be knocked over. What the actual <laughs> As much as they're quite space saving, I just absolutely felt terrified every time I had it open that I was going to knock it over and all the paint would be gone. So no, not loving this paint. However, it is what it is. Okay, anyway, we're gonna move past that and talk about, you know, the paints. Part of me wanted to be really shocked so I could go, wow, I've just found the paints that everybody should be using. But then the reality sank in that there's probably a reason not everyone's using these paints and why everyone's not rushing to order them from Russia. That was not meant to be a pun. I'm sure in Asia, and sort of the Eurasian border, these paints are probably far more prevalent than even like Humbrol or Ravel. These are probably much wider use. However, here they're not. Here no one really knows them outside of paints in the starter set and we all know that paints in the starter set tend to be already dried up or broken or rubbish. So not a good point of reference. Why am I saying this? Well, because it turns out pretty accurately these paints are groundbreaking. And that's going to be sort of the theme of the overall Zvezda feel. To their credit, they were extremely consistent and I did find that their pigmentation was pretty good as well. They applied really nicely, however, they did have some issues with falling and also with leveling. I did have to work the paints as a medium a bit more than I did with other paint manufacturers or brands that I've used during the course of this video project. 
Does it mean that they're bad? Absolutely not. If you said I had to use Vesda paints forever, it wouldn't be the end of the world. They are not the worst paints out there. However, they're definitely not the best either. So I, as much as I'm trying to keep the mystery of where everyone's placed, obviously these are not going to place first. As I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon for paints to sort of separate when initially going onto the model, but I did find this on the second layer as well. So it seems like there's something slightly different about these sort of paints that I need a longer time to explore and be able to use effectively. That's not uncommon. Paints are paints, you know, you're not going to be able to use them perfectly the first time. However, it does mean I can't say that these are going to be super accessible to people. But the model itself, probably my favourite from this project potentially. I hate to say it, but it looked bloody good. All of the colours looked really accurate. I was really happy with the end result. Obviously, as I did a Zvezda kit, I did have the Zvezda paint numbers, and so I could paint it fairly accurately just based on that alone. And yeah, I, I was really happy with what I got, so make of that what you will. <laughs> Overall, using Zvezda paints was a really unique opportunity. It's the first time I've ordered something and been sent a message saying, by the way, this paint doesn't have a warranty for if it freezes. If it freezes, then, you know, the actual quality of the paint could be affected. That was a unique thing to have and made me worry that they were going to be your fault by the time that I'd received them, but luckily it seems not to be the case. In addition to that though, to add that I ordered these in the harsh Russian winter and they arrived completely fine. So compared to some other brands that we won't mention, <coughs> HELLA, <coughs> then, you know, it seems to say a lot or really not even need to say a lot because of the silence, she is deafening. So, we're on to our final paint, are we? Let's go. Vallejo. Vallejo is a brand that I probably should already be using. It's not something that I seldom use due to lack of desire, but more so that I already have Ravel, so why would I just abandon everything I have already? But it's one that everyone always talks about. As I mentioned before, this featured in Squidmar's video on, you know, what paint to use for a tabletop painter. So I already knew these paints were going to be fantastic. I just never got around to using them. The model I'm doing is more obscure, I'll give you that. It's the Heinkel HE112, which is developed from the competitor to the BF109. Didn't really get used in German service and was sold internationally to, I think, Romania, Hungary, and also Spain. Spain actually got that. I think only aerial victory against Allied aircraft when P-38s occurred upon their airspace in Morocco and that's the actual model we're going to do today. Obviously there will be a full video about this but I just wanted to add that information in because I thought it was cool. The paints are so well known that finding matches what you need is a breeze and actually for a lot of model kits it'll be in the instructions like the Vallejo colours next to maybe the Humble ones or the Ravel ones or whatever like you know it's actually not too bad for Vallejo. I will say that these had a more unique feel, like Hitaka did, but not in the way that Hitaka paints did. It's different. Okay, that was not explained well at all, so let me try again. I found these paints were like super pigmented, like you did not need any paint to paint anything. They took the tiniest little bit because it was so rich with pigmentation. It's very different to how I think a lot of other model paints do work and do feel. And I don't know, maybe this means that you can mix it a lot easier for airbrushing. I don't know, it's just definitely a very different formula to what you have for, say, Ravel, Hella, Humbrol, or Italeri. They all feel very different to both the Hitaka and to the Vallejo paints. However, unlike with Hitaka, I didn't find that this hindered my enjoyment of painting with these. I actually found these absolutely fine to work with. It's probably fair to say that I didn't do the best job at leveling my paints out, and that's probably user error. Again, I've tried to incorporate this, it's the first time I've used the paint, but I don't know. It, it, it wasn't as easy as I think some of the other paints on the list were. Vallejo seems to be the professional paint of choice and it is probably something I need to learn to use, so I will probably keep trying to use it in the future, but it is something I think is worth bearing in mind. This does have advantages and disadvantages, and I actually found on a later project I did, it's actually a video that's already come out, <laughs> but, you know, I, I had to get some really just ridiculous colours on a dark surface, and using Vallejo meant I had to use less paint, paint was super pigmented, showed up really nicely, and worked really 
well behaved, you know, it's just a reliable thing. I can really see why people love Vallejo and the price isn't too bad either, it's not something that I think would scare away a beginner. At the end of the day though, I got a model that I think looks fantastic, you know, this, I couldn't really fold the paint too badly. Is it my favourite paint on the planet? No. But am I going to use it again? Absolutely. It's definitely a good paint. I can't fault that. I, I can't objectively sit here and say it's a bad paint, it's not. I don't think any of these were, okay, one was, but otherwise I don't think it was a bad paint, you know? I think a lot of it's just about how you like it. You know, we all have differences. Conversion charts. Now I mentioned earlier that I think this is important to talk about because when you're choosing which brand of paint to use, you make certain sacrifices, whether that's that you can only order online, whether that's you can only order it from abroad, whether it's that it needs a specific thinner, whether that you can just use tap water, the price of it or the cheapness of it, it's all relative to each individual person and what they're willing to sacrifice or put up with. Now, when we're doing model painting, I personally think it's different to tabletop in the sense that we're not necessarily trying to achieve a sort of fictional colour. So I know when I used to do tabletop, I could compromise and mix a couple of paints together to get a somewhat similar colour and I'd be okay with it. But for model makers, a lot of it's about getting the most accurate paint possible. It has to be 100% historically accurate. And that's something that can be really hard to do unless one, you're gifted at it, or two, you have a conversion chart. Because I can tell you right now that most model manufacturers will promote their own paints first, which obviously is just a sensible thing to do. And if they put other paint brands on there, it's generally two or three. And it is the same few paints that come up quite regularly. Humbrol, Tamiya, Ravel, Vallejo. You know, it's the same paint brands wherever you look. So using some of the more obscure brands like Heller, potentially Atari, or even extra acrylic, you might be finding yourself in a position where you don't know whether your paint is 100% the right one or not. And for people who have a limited budget, who have really, really calculated whether or not they can afford a paint or not, buying an extra paint might not be an option. So if they order the wrong one, they might just go, I can't do this model. And that could be really devastating to someone. So I think it's then really important that we just really openly say that some brands won't have conversion charts. And I know Ravel does have conversion charts, but quite often they're a mix or you might have to Google colour a bit more. It's still possible, but it might take you a bit more work. In some instances, like Hella in France, I imagine that's less of a problem because it's probably a paint that's supplied in your local model shop and you can go, cool, that is the right paint. I can see exactly what it is in person. That's the right one. But when you're ordering online, sometimes paints can look slightly different, particularly when they're an image compared to what you get in person. So we're about to go through the results, but one thing that I've just briefly touched on, I want to go through first. It's just okay to use different brands. People, for some reason, get absolutely obsessed and consumed by the idea that they have to be loyal to one brand. And I think this is partly due to consistency, but also because just how people are in general. We like to have things regular and consistent, and I've definitely become less inclined to that, particularly by doing this video. I'd be open to almost every single brand, except Hella. I think the only other point I wanted to bring in as well is about accessibility. So, and it sort of relates to using multiple brands. So like I've said before, because of the hours I work, most shops are shut by the time I finish work. And in my old job, I used to work Saturday and Sundays fairly regularly. And that could mean that by the time I finished work, there was nowhere I could get models from, except Hobbycraft. That included paints. And if I'd forgotten a paint just because, you know, I didn't realise or I'd missed one in the instructions or, hey, I just bought the wrong paint, I couldn't go anywhere except probably grab them. So that's completely fine. It's completely fine to go to just a main store and buy a Ravel paint because you're out of it. It doesn't mean that you're abandoning a brand. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. What matters most is what works for you. Also, can we just agree now that ethics, Ravel, Hella, Zazda, everyone just stop selling kits with those rubbish little pots in. You know the ones I mean. You know, these that I've got millions of, they are rubbish. They are almost always dried out. 
and I've never ever managed to get a kit with a complete set of paints. Either raise the price slightly and sell full bottles of paint in them, or just don't do them. You are basically producing waste. I can't imagine anything worse than buying a kit, which I have done for a relative before, them getting it and then the paint's not working. Can we please, just as a community, stop doing this? Just, just like you only need to charge like a little bit more and have full paint in. Surely these are products that you use to get people into the hobby anyway. Alright, rant over. Let's get into the results, shall we? In last place, as we've already said, Hella. Um, just to put this in perspective for you, they came last by a long, long way. They got 26 points below the next paint. Compared to the rest of the paints, which are all within 18 points from like the second last to the winner. That's how far out Hella were. It breaks my heart. I love you, Hella. But this just wasn't it. I'm sorry. Coming in eighth place then is, I guess, his first step. As I've said, ignoring all country bias here. That's just how they placed. I personally actually think I got one of the best results as a model with this, but lots of things did factor into this including accessibility, which I could not rate very highly because right now you cannot buy these paints except in starter sets or through really convoluted means that I'm not even sure if they're legal because you'd be bypassing like, you know, a trade embargo, but that's not something I'm going to do so I'm not concerned about. But yeah, not an easy to get paint. They did also have like, you know, kind of average pigmentation and their paint pot is horrifying like no but no although it did better than hella because at least i could actually use these paints so so yeah it wasn't that the there was even particularly bad it's just that every other paint is above it and the competition is so fierce someone just had to be in eighth place and Zvezda is you if i'm honest if you could probably still get you you probably wouldn't be but that's just the way it rolls next up um an absolute shock to me is a tallery but also, ooh, it's a tie. Also extra acrylic. Let's start with the Tallery then. So these are super accessible paints. Get them from Amazon, get them in at, like those pre-made bundles, which are fantastic value for money. You know, out of all of the manufacturers, like lot of like actual model kits, I think these probably sell the best pre-made sets. So that's fantastic. They do, however, suffer from an outdated paint pot design. And again, it's not that these are bad, it's just that everyone else is just always that little bit better. Their leveling was just mediocre, as was their calling, but I have more that I'm really happy with, that I like, and I'd proudly show off to people. So even though I did a paint scheme wrong, I can't fold the paints. Well, I mean, obviously I've scored them, so I folded them, but you know what I mean. As for extra colour, pigmentation felt a bit not it's just not the best again it's not that it's bad it's just i felt others were higher up there the same sort of points leveling and pulling i felt probably weren't necessarily the absolute best but maybe if i did a lot more models this would improve but again it's hard to do that for one video because the amount of time it would take me would be unreal maybe i'll do this in two years time and i'll have completely different feelings but right now I just found they weren't quite at the level of everyone else, but at the same time, I don't think Extra Acrylic have been going as long as some of the other brands. And you know, I've actually recommended this paint to one of my friends because I said it's actually a really good starting place, um, because they've got such a wide variety of paints and they're constantly improving. So it feels like a good brand to use and I've seen other really fantastic results with them. Again, using multiple brands is absolutely a viable, you know, way to do your models and extra acrylic and not bad by any means. Coming in next is Targa. Okay, so the scheme I did was really simple compared to some of the others. Although I don't really think any of the schemes I did were particularly challenging, I could easily see the really dense pigmentation, the levelling and pooling were on point as well. For what I bought, I felt the paints did cost too much. I literally felt that when ordering them, which is never really a good sign. It doesn't mean the paints are bad, it just meant that I feel like I paid too much for them. The paints that I specifically got was more expensive than other paint sets though, but it wasn't saying that it was like out of stock or I was buying like last of the supply, so I'm not too sure why that was the case. 
I have already did factor into their results. Personally, they didn't score well in enjoyment either. I just did not like using them at all. That's my personal opinion. I probably wouldn't buy Kotaku paints again. Again, my opinion. If I was using an airbrush, absolutely would try them again, but not as a brush painter. So, after we've done Hitaka, it's on to the top three, and yes, I know what you're thinking, there are four paints, so there is a tie at some point here. So where's the tie? Well, it's here in third place. In third place, we have two brands, and I am gonna get so much for the order of this. We have both Humbrol and Vallejo. Oh my god, what the hell of the universe is this? So yes, I can already hear all the hardcore modellers screaming at their screens that I am awful, that I don't know what I'm doing because I put Valeo and Humbrol on the same stand. But I'm probably looking at this at a very different perspective from a lot of other people. I will add to this that if this was about tabletop painting or if this was not including certain other factors, then yes, Vallejo would be right at the top. They did well in other videos. Again, check Squidmars video. But I'm doing this based on my experience as a modeler, as a brush painter, and also factoring in the fact that I can buy sets of paint as well. They were strong in different areas, and that's why we've got the result that we have. So for example, Humbrol, or Epix, however you want to call it, scored really poorly in sort of consistency or quality control, as it's, it's probably easier to know as. They were also worth off when it came to leveling and pooling. However, they were way more accessible as a paint. They are a lot more fun to use, in my opinion. Again, my personal opinion, I found them a lot nicer to use, a lot more fun. And, and if I'm honest, their price is just fantastic. The value for money in that little set is actually ridiculous. And also I got three paintbrushes, I think, with it as well. It's unheard of value. So I, I would happily recommend them buy one of these sets. I never thought I would say this, I never thought I'd be pushing humble paints on people, but here I am. <laughs> what world are we in? <laughs> now Vallejo I'm not an expert in at all, but you've heard the strong points of Umbral. It's sort of the opposite for me for Vallejo. Pigmentation, fantastic. Enjoyment, sort of middle for me. Not, not best, but not worst. They were great for pulling, great for leveling, and they had better consistency. But the combination is what really mattered to me. There was also the aspect of price. Price is something that's really important, especially at the moment, and probably for the next 16 months, and I'm real crush it in this category. So, you know, there's a reason they came third. It's not because Humbrol are probably objectively better paints. It's a multitude of factors from how we are looking at it today. Okay, hopefully you're all done screaming at the screen so you can see which one's number two, and this also came as the shock to me because I was expecting this to potentially come lower, actually, and it's Ravel. So you already know who the winner is probably, but hey ho. Throughout this project, what I found was when I was using Help Ravel again, it was like going back to an old friend that you, you know, haven't seen for five years, but you can just go, hey, let's carry on as if we've never never stopped seeing each other. Like, it was that easy. They did come second in consistency and also came second in levelling and pooling. Again, there is a, probably a lot of bias just by the fact that I've used these paints a lot. I am aware of this. I have been no, like, keeper of secrets about this. Like, yes, it, I've used these paints for a long time. I'm probably going to get better results with them. It is the way it is. I am very open to this project again in the future and using some other paints more. But modelling is such a time consuming hobby, it's just not reasonable for me to do like, I know, 10 models of each brand, it's just not gonna happen. Not in the time frame I wanted to do this video, which is, you know, this year, so it is what it is. So, we're on to our winner, Tamiya. Tamiya are what I've always viewed as like the premium brand of modelling supplies. If you want tweezers that will outlive the common cold and stay sharp, get Tamiya. You want tape that will be able to tape down and survive a lava flow over it? Get Tamiya. They're just known for being extremely high quality. I mean, in Humble's own TV show, they use Tamiya glue. So, like, even Humble knows that Tamiya glue is amazing. 
Yes, I did do a very simple colour scheme, but you know what? These paints speak for themselves, and I have used them elsewhere, and I think it's just universally known that Tamiya paints are absolutely fantastic. It was not a shock to me that Tamiya scored highly, and it's not even a shock to me that came first over my personal favourite brand of paint. The only thing to bear out for Tamiya is that, you know, using a proper thinner, you know, you'll probably get even better results. I don't think I really needed to do that, so I didn't. I actually did just thin it down with a little bit of water. Some paints won't like that, some paints will also split with that. I think I probably just, just about got away with it just because I was doing this really simple, easy colour scheme. Everything just fit together so beautifully that it was just, it was easy, it was a joy, it was just fantastic. So that's it, we have our winner, it's Tamiya. If you've loved what you've seen here though, please feel free to subscribe, it really does help me out and you know, drop a comment below, let me know what paint brand you use or why you've maybe moved away from a different paint brand. If you want to see more content like this, like me testing brushes or something, let me know and if you want to support me, you can always do so over on Kofi, which is kind of like Patreon but a bit different. You can do a one-off donation or you can do it as a monthly donation, the link is in the description below. Also, can we try and get some engagement with Hella? Like, they're on Instagram, I think. I think they're on Facebook as well. Can we just, like, bug Hella to send me some things that actually work? Because I really want to like Hella. Hella, you've devastated me. Come on, Hella, make this right. Show me that your paints are good. I promise I'll do a glowing video if you just send me paints for work. Please. Also, another D520 kit, I wouldn't go amiss, but please! <laughs> That's gonna do it for me though. Thank you so much, guys. This has been one hell of an experience. I love you all. Bye! Thanks for watching the video. I really appreciate it. Hit the subscribe button and notification bell to be notified of every new video on Mondays. You'll also be able to see me stream live on YouTube. Thanks again. I really appreciate it. Have fun modeling!